Hi, I'm Joe Sinchella. I'm a head and neck cancer and reconstructive surgeon here at the University of California, Irvine. I'm also chair of the Department of Otolaryngology. One thing that's often missed, I think, in the patient-physician relationship is, is, is who that physician is and, and what kind of inspired them and motivated them to be in that situation. And so I'm sitting here with Dr. Yara Haydar, another head and neck cancer and reconstructive surgeon, and we're going to learn a little bit about her today. Thanks, Dr. Haydar, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, my first question is, what personal qualities do you think have been most important in your success as a head and neck cancer surgeon? I think that the thing that, that I bring to the table that's, that's sometimes a little different than most cancer surgeons is that I've had that firsthand and family experience battling cancer. And so I always draw back and think think back to, to, to how that felt and the stressors that came along with um, a new diagnosis of cancer with my own patients um, and try to ease their own concerns and really help guide them throughout their treatment, thinking about it holistically, not just about how do we manage this cancer, but rather how do we get them through this um, and how do we reduce their stress and make sure they're sleeping at night um, with this new diagnosis. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So much attention is paid to the technical skill of the surgeon, but at its core, head and neck cancer is treatment of the patient and, and having that empathy. And I think the patient really looks up to you as their cancer doctor, and they need you to get them through this. You're one of the most important and influential people in their lives at that moment. So you just remember that. You just remember who you, what role you hold in their care right now, and how do you, and just help them get through it, um, just like their own family member. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What inspired you to become a head and neck cancer surgeon? I always tell people that I got lucky. I didn't know I wanted to get into medicine. I made a late undergraduate decision to become a doctor. Um, and the same thing with becoming an ear, nose, and throat resident. I didn't know that until late in my medical career, made a last minute decision. And I got really lucky because within ENT, I found head and neck cancer surgery. I really like the complexity of the cancer care. I like cancer patients. That was one of the biggest drawings to head and neck cancer surgery is the patients themselves in the clinic. Um, I just wanted to be more influential as a doctor. And I felt like the way to do that is to become a cancer surgeon. What is that pathway to be a cancer surgeon? What did you have to go through? So depending on the surgery that you do, it's a little different, but with head and neck cancer surgery, you do your four years of undergraduate career at minimum. Some people do um, an extra degree in between, um, but you do four years of undergraduate, four years of medical school, five years of residency, and another additional year of fellowship training. Um, so I went through that path. And along the way, you do each part of that in a different area. So there was a lot of moving in between. Yeah. How do you handle difficult or emotional conversations with patients and their families? Yeah. Like, do you have any strategies for how you kind of deal with those personally? It's tough. I think that, um, I, I don't know how everybody handles it. I mean, the patients I think need to see a strong figure in front of them. So a lot of times, even if I'm feeling emotionally vulnerable, I try to withhold. Um, but I do want to show that empathy so that they understand that I really do care about about their outcome. Um, so it's tough. It's definitely a case-by-case a -case basis. Um, and I change my strategy depending on who's across from me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. How do you stay up to date with developments in the field of head and neck cancer? Um, it's, you know, thankfully, we're in a field where things are developing all the time. And so staying up to date is important in order to stay to be a good cancer surgeon. Um, being in an academic hospital like we are, I think that really adds to our ability to continue to stay up to date with, that, with all of the treatment options. So we have that multidisciplinary care. We have clinical trials that are ongoing all the time. We have the newest devices that are available and accessible to us. Um, so unlike most other hospitals, an academic hospital really affords all the possible options that you have for the best cancer care. And so with, with all that's in front of me, I, I stay I, I say I go to all the conferences, I go to national meetings, I, I present and publish on our on our own um, on our own topics. I think these kinds of things just keep me up to date. Yeah, it's a lot of work working for an academic hospital and being that up to date, but it's obviously worth it for your patients. I think so too. I think some people see it as a little bit of a sacrifice when you're in an academic hospital because you have to do all these other ancillary things like publish and teach and and go to different meetings and conferences, but I do think it adds to your overall ability to be a good clinical physician. Yeah. Um, so so I, I'm glad that I'm in this environment. Yeah, and ultimately, like I said, it, it definitely benefits the patients. I think so too. Um, what advice would you give to someone who's seeking to kind of cultivate a fulfilling and meaningful personal life alongside a, a really busy career? 
How do you handle both? Oh, I don't know if I'm the person to answer that one. That's a tough answer. <laughs> I think that it's hard because, you know, you do have to sacrifice a lot of your own personal life in order to, um, uh, to maintain a good career. Um, but you know, you can, you can accomplish both. And I think it's a work in progress. I'm learning things every day. And I think five years from now, I'm going to behave differently than how I'm behaving right now. And I'm definitely better off managing that balance today than I was five years ago. And so I think I'm just going to continue to learn new things. But I, I think that we always have to remember that in order to be a good physician and a good surgeon, you have to be happy in life. And so you have to do, you have to focus on yourself and treat yourself in order to treat others. What do you believe are the most important skills or qualities for effective communication with patients and their families? I think that it's easy, especially as you know, doctors ourselves, that we, we want to use medical jargon and make it make it uh, it's just difficult to understand. Again, I've been on the other side, so I know when someone's explaining something to me, and I, I am a doctor myself, um, using medical jargon, it, it gets confusing. Um, so I think you have to remember that they are coming from a knowledge base that's different than yours, and really clearly explain things in a way that's um, you know, more understanding to, to people of all professions. Um, and again, it's a case by case basis. So I talk to a doctor differently than I talk to an engineer patient of mine, different than I talk to a teenager. Um, everyone's a little different. Yeah. seems like a real skill. You learn all of this stuff and it's such technical language and high level, and you have to kind of distill it down so that everyone can understand with the complexity of it. Yeah, you're right. And it's and it's tough. I feel like it's something that we just continue to adapt and learn on every day. Sometimes I, I walk away from an interaction and think I didn't, I don't think I handled that very well. Um, but I learned from that for the next interaction. Yeah, it's amazing. How do you, how do you approach the balance between specialization and generalization in your medical practice? Oh, I like to be specialized. I mean, that's kind of the core of our careers, right? We are head and neck cancer surgeons. We see head and neck cancer period. I think that it, that does that does well. I mean, that does better for patients because all we do is head and neck cancer all the time, so we do it well. If there's a patient, you know, in our in our jobs and in our practice, if, if I have a patient that comes in with an ear disorder, even though I'm ear, nose, and throat trained, I have a ear surgeon that is well trained and well much better versed than I am in how to manage that condition. So I have I can have I have that luxury to send that patient over. So I actually don't want to balance it. I, I appreciate the specialization. Yeah. Said all that is you could either be a jack of all trades, master of none, or yeah. master of one. Exactly, exactly. Right. How about a little bit about yourself? What hobbies or interests do you do outside of medical practice? Oh, that's interesting. You know, I just said that I was a. Uh, uh, I like to specialize in medicine and and do you know become a you know just not be a generalist and, and really focus on one aspect of my career. Well, in, in life, I'm not I'm not as good at it. So. Um, I don't, I haven't mastered anything really that well, but I'm willing to try everything. Um, the current hobby is, is, is running. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm starting to get into long distance running, training for a marathon, uh, at the end of this fall. Let's see That's if great. I, let's see, let's see if it actually happens, but, <laughs> but I've done quite a few half marathons. And so running is a big part of my life now, and it does take up a lot of time. So that's the current hobby, but, but I'm willing to try it all. You don't take it easy. You go from running around the hospital all day to running yeah. after work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what do you believe are the most important qualities for a successful head and neck cancer surgeon to possess? I think that uh, the best cancer surgeons, and some of it is, you know, technical skills and knowing all the clinical jargon and all that kind of stuff, which, which we all need as a physician, but specific, I think, to head and neck cancer is trying to think about a patient holistically and understanding that head and neck cancer care can really affect someone's life, their identity, who they are, how they function. And so thinking about those aspects of someone's care really can make you a better head and neck cancer surgeon. All right, one last question. How do you think the field of head and neck cancer surgery will evolve in the coming years and, and what steps are you taking to kind of prepare for that? Well, yeah, I can't, I can't predict the future. I don't know what we're planning to do, but I think in general, cancer surgery is gonna become, continually become more minimally invasive. Um, so reduce morbidity from surgery, improve functional outcomes and be able to do the surgeries um, in a more minimally invasive format is, is, is where our field is headed. I think being in an academic center, I am always up to date with the newest technologies that are available and going to national meetings and national conferences allows us to see these things as they're becoming a part of people's everyday practice so we can adopt it earlier than the rest. Um, so I think that, that my access to everything that this academic center really offers allows me to continue to 
progress and, and be up to date with the surgeries that we offer. Yeah, that's crazy to think 20 years ago, we didn't even imagine a robot could be used to, to access the head and neck. And, and we used to have to do these big surgeries to get to the back of the throat. And now we can do it without even an incision in the neck. It's, right. it's, it's hard to imagine. We can't even imagine what's going to be here 20 years from now. Right. I think the robot's a great example. The robot was FDA approved for head and neck cancer use in 2009. Now we're using several iterations forward of the robot. So the robots become a much, much better equipment, um, uh, easier to access more difficult, challenging surgical sites. And I think that nowadays, if your surgeon is not offering you robotic surgery with an oropharyngeal cancer, they're, they're not up to date with the newest equipment. Um, and most hospitals do not actually have the newest robotic equipment or even fellowship trained robotic surgeons. So I think that um, being in a place like this really helps us stay up to date. And I think that's the kind of thing that I expect moving forward, newer technologies and, and our ability to access it. Yeah. Do you think surgeons will be needed 30, 40 years? I know. You know, people talked when they when they brought out the robot, they talked about a surgeon being able to do the surgery across the country. And I think things like that are actually in our future. Uh, but never needing a surgeon at all and just having the robot do the surgery by itself and you not there, I think that's far, far too in the future. Um, so I don't think we're going to be headed there in our lifetime. Well, thank you for joining us, Dr. Hader. It's been uh, really great talking with you and catching up. And hopefully the patients and our, our uh, followers um, have a little better picture of kind of why you do what you do. Yeah, this was fun to do. Thanks.